Lord, we do not always rush to do your will. Often we tiptoe our way into obedience, dragging old habits and mindsets with us. Help us to delight at your voice and to trust that your calling is always good news. Amen. able, please rise and join with me in the call to worship. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. Please remain standing as we light the Advent candle, the candle of peace. We light this candle as a symbol of the peace we have in the promise of the Prince of Peace. For the Lord will fulfill his promise, and we will speak comfort at God's command, speaking tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry to her that her warfare is ended. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, O come, O come, Emmanuel, number 88, in the hymnals, verses 1 through 4.
God does not want anyone to perish, but rather for all to come to repentance. Therefore, let us confess our sins, for God's salvation is at hand. We find in God, you have sent us prophets, and we have not listened. We have not always determined what is best, or made way for your reign in our lives, our church, and our society. Forgive us, we pray, and renew your covenant with us, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, by the mercy of Christ, your sins are forgiven, for salvation is at hand for all who turn to God. You may be seated. Any of you heard the word prologue before? Do you know what a prologue is? It's a funny sounding word, isn't it? Well, a prologue is what comes at the very beginning of a story. It actually tells you what the story is going to be about. So if you've ever heard a story that was told to you and someone said, this is what the story is about, that would be a prologue. The Bible has one too, and we've actually been talking about it last week. We've been talking about it today. The choir actually just sang about it. it. Comes from the Gospel of Mark. These are the first three verses, the prologue of Mark's Gospel. I want you to listen to these words. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. 
Who was it that went out and talked about making a way for God before Jesus? Who told the prologue about Jesus? John the Baptist. That's right. You guys have really good ears. John the Baptist. Mark's gospel says he was the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, just as our, the choir just said, prepare the way of the Lord. That is what Advent is. That's what these candles are. That is what the stories we read about in the Bible, they remind us of all the preparation that went into Jesus coming. It reminds us every year, again and again and again, to prepare to welcome God into our hearts. And all because someone told us what to expect. And we thank God this day, not only for the great gift God gave us in Jesus, but for the ones who came before Jesus, telling us to prepare the way for him. So will you pray with me? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the gift of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And thank you for all the people you sent, you sent to, prepare the way to prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus. Help us, Help us to, also to also prepare the way, prepare the way for, Jesus, for Jesus, for our world. For our world. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, and see you all next week. And as we prepare to read together God's word and hear God's word to us this morning, let us pray. For God's wisdom. Mighty God, send your Holy Spirit to speak peace, that the good news of this age may be proclaimed through your word, which stands forever. Amen. Now let us read together from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Those words can be found on page 836 of your pew Bible or on the screens behind me. I will begin with the odd verses. You will respond with the even verses. Let us read together from God's word. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. A reading from the book of Psalms is from Psalm 85, verses 1 and 2, and verses 8 through 13. Again, those words can be found on the screens behind me or page 493 of your pew Bible. Listen again for God's word. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Skipping to verse 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. This is the word of God. Peace is a pretty easy word to say. And we think we really know what it actually means, but it's not always so. 
It's something that is a great idea, an ideal always to work towards, but as many of us know, it's an ideal that's much more difficult to realize in our world. Jesus, later in the Gospel, speaks about there being wars and rumors of wars. We know that reality in the Middle East, North Korea, Sudan, the Congo, Myanmar. That's to say nothing of violent protests all around the world, terrorist attacks, mass killings that regularly fill our newscasts or social media feeds. Our politicians really aren't much better either. They excel at hating the other side, vilifying, even dehumanizing one another, but have a much more difficult time of telling us what they actually believe or stand for. They're very good about saying what's wrong with the other person. Rather than recognize the immense power that many hold, elected leaders all over the world focus not on the common good for all, but what's best for them, their position, their power and authority. What it means for other people isn't even a consideration. Interpersonal relations aren't much better either. The recent flood of stories from the Me Too campaign have shown how people have commoditized and objectified others created in God's own image for their own personal pleasure, satisfaction, for their need to exert power and control. The idea of peace in our world today can seem like nothing more than a bad joke. Last week, we examined the theme of hope and explored that idea of how not only to be a people of hope, but how to live into and make that hope a reality, how to spread that hope with peace and its stunning absence in our society, our daily life. We might ask, is peace just as ridiculous as hope? As we progress through Advent, as we light more and more candles, as the light of God becomes brighter and brighter, we might ask, is this what we wait for, what we have, what passes for life? The reality is that the peace we have, or what often passes for peace, is just peace in pieces. Now, it might help for our purposes to look a little bit deeper at what the Bible actually means when it uses the word peace. Again, we often think we know what that means. It means no conflict, no violent action, and that's part of it, but that's a very basic, a bare minimum definition. What the scriptures reveal about peace is so much more than just the absence of conflict. To really get in on this idea the second week of Advent, we need to get the whole picture of peace. Now, biblically, they go back to two words, the Hebrew word shalom and the Greek word irene. They have a lot more in common with each other than they do with our modern English word, peace. Peace in the biblical sense was not just a state of being, a state where conflict or hostility was absent. They were a way of life that people came together and lived. A way of life that is the ultimate expression of being pro-life, of having, as Jesus said, life and life abundantly, not just for the privileged few, but for everyone. This idea of peace has a lot to do with God's vision for the world, God's kingdom about the defining characteristics of what the kingdom would be all about, not just what we as God's people would proclaim with our mouths, but what we would work for each and every day. In everything we do, it would permeate God's people so much that as we do it, we're not even conscious that we're doing these things. It's like a scent or an aroma or an odor we carry about. It just wafts out, but it's a good scent, a holy scent, a pure scent, one that is pleasing, one that is necessary. God's people knew this. They used these words in this way. If a place was special, if it was holy or sacred, if it was set aside for God's purpose, they would often use a variant of the word peace in that place's name. Salem, the location of God's first temple, is a version or a variant of shalom. Jerusalem, the city of God, literally means God's peace. For all the conflict that takes place in Jerusalem today and for the past thousands of years, that almost seems like a joke, that the city named God's peace has been the one city that has known peace the least. 
the typical Jewish greeting for thousands of years, even to this day, is ma shalom hem, means how is your peace. In Arabic, the equivalent is al salam alaikum, how is your peace. Peace was a reality that even in the most basic of interactions or greetings was something God's people always bring to mind. It's something meant to inspire God's people to be, as Jesus said, not peacekeepers, but peacemakers. But we reduce peace, that word, to something that hippies chant. It's something John Lennon sang about, give a chance. It's a symbol that we put on t-shirts or bumper stickers or posters. That's all we really think of it as. Interestingly though, this sign, the peace sign, was developed in England in the late 1950s by a group that took the inspiration from the semaphore communication system. Semaphore is where someone holds two flags and holds them at different angles to symbolize different letters. Holding one arm up and one arm at a lowered 45 degree angle on one side and then the other side symbolize the letters N and D, nuclear disarmament. That was the thing threatening people in 1958. It's the thing as we are on the dawn of 2018 on the Korean Peninsula that seems just as timely now. Is this what passes for peace, though? Signs and symbols, words, ideas. Peace in the biblical sense is much more than just this. We get a glimpse of that in Psalm 85. Peace is one of the attributes, one of the gifts God has given to the world. Or to put another way, to make it another piece of the puzzle, is to say that God's nature is peaceful. That God promotes peace, that wants us to do it as well we often only pay it lip service. Where we define peace as the absence of conflict, hostility, or violence, God's notion is similar to how Jesus defined things in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember the commandments. You've heard it said, do not kill. But Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that commandment's a lot more than not taking life. If you even think something hostile about someone, you're just as guilty. It's not enough to just keep your hands to yourself. Lusting after another, oogling after someone, objectifying them in any way is just the same as committing adultery. That same definition applies for peace. It's not just the lack of, it's working for as well because it's about doing what promotes life and happiness and wholeness in everyone. Yes, it's about not being violent, about not taking up arms or weapons, but about removing the very causes of violence in our world. Whether that be international policy on a global scale, whether that be domestic violence in a particular family. It's about thinking well of others, but not just thinking well, but making sure all of their needs are met in advance. All that is necessary for health, for education, for wholeness, all of these holes that society tries to fill in people's lives. It's about filling them, not for ourselves, but in other people, about doing the best thing for other. That is what the idea of peacemaking is all about. That is the cost of being a peacemaker as well. In many ways, it comes down to verse 9, which talks about salvation, big, heavy faith word, salvation. Jesus' own name in Aramaic, Yeshua, it's what we would call Joshua, means God saves. Jesus literally lived up to his name. Salvation is what God is about, and peace is one of the ways that God makes that come. But how does God bring that about? Talks about God's glory, God's glory dwelling on the earth. Another way of saying that is this is about God being with us on the earth. That is what glory is, God's very presence with us, Emmanuel, God with us, realized. And verses 10 through 13 show what that looks like or what that can look like. All of these taken together to give a picture of God with us, a God of peace. Hesed is the Hebrew word often translated as steadfast love. It starts it all off. It links with the idea of faithfulness or in some other translations, truth. It notes that righteousness 
often synonymous with justice, is intimately linked with peace. What separates righteousness and peace is gone because the two are depicted as coming together and kissing. The world gets in on it too. Truth and faithfulness depicted as fertile ground sprouting forth life. God's righteousness looking down from heaven, giving it all the growth. God gives the good and so does God's creation. Everything that God has given us, everything God has provided us for is giving forth its produce. Righteousness laying the paving stones of that highway that is coming. The one that John was shouting about in the wilderness. The one who comes, makes his way through the wilderness. The chaos, the hatred, the confusion of the world. That is what biblical peace is about. It's about making that highway, making that way through and making it through our own hearts. Peace is often dreamt of, but is far less realized in our world. God's question to us, though, what are we doing about that? What are we willing to do about that? What are we willing to give up to achieve that? What are we doing with the peace that is in pieces to make it whole and complete, as those words mean? Is it just a pipe dream? Is it something we hope and strive for, but in the end, we know we will never really achieve it. Is there even a reason to hope for peace in our world, our communities, our families, in our church? Yes. That's the good news of scripture. That's the good news of the gospel. Yes, there is a reason to hope, and that reason is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because one of the other forgotten, often neglected, realities about peace is that peace is too a gift of God to us and as a gift of God it's one that is meant to be received and passed on at the same time Advent is a time of waiting and expecting of looking back and looking forward a time to prepare it's indeed a time to hope about all of these things, but just as the psalm begins, it looks back at what God has already done. It says, because God has done this, we can truly hope in what is to come. Rather than just passively waiting for these things to happen, we can live into hope. We can be a people of hope. We can be people who bring about hope in our world. And what truly is God's glory but that? It's taking the ever-increasing light that these candles represent, the light of God coming into our world and making it more and more and more bright, more and more present in the world. It's about reflecting it outward because our world needs this. We need this. This is what the waiting in Advent is all about. These themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, love, they're all facets of God's very own nature, of God's own glory that dwells with us. And when we do the things of God, these are the things the world sees. When we get it right, we spread them out in the world. We make them a little bit more present when we get it right. We receive that gift of God and pass it on to whomever needs it, wherever we are. And we do it in our own stumbling, imperfect ways. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we're just trying. But when we do, we make the world a little bit happier, a little bit more bright, a little more peaceful in the places God has put us. We speak of Jesus as God's greatest gift to the world, but then we do the worst possible thing with it. We hold on to it. We don't let it go. We keep it all to ourselves. God's gifts don't work that way. Just as we're receiving them with one hand, simultaneously we're called to give it away with the other. This is how God's kingdom works, by sharing it and living it. Candles were picked for Advent, not by chance, because flame has an interesting property, one that describes God's own property as well. The same thing hope and peace and joy and love have as well. The property is that the more you share that, the more you give it away, it doesn't diminish, but rather it grows larger. Line up a string of candles, one after the other. That flame is giving itself away, but it's not smaller for it. It's bigger and 
bigger and bigger and bigger. Every Christmas Eve when we gather in this room and pass that light around, it grows and grows and grows and grows. That is the way of God's blessings, the ones we are called to share. The more we give it away, the more we have. That is peacemaking. Not peacekeeping, but peacemaking. That is whole peace, not peace in pieces. A time to be at peace, not a time to be in pieces, though that's often where we find ourselves. It is hard, this peacemaking. It is difficult. It demands a lot out of us, our very lives even. But this, this is the truth. This is the gift. This is the love of God, that the more we give it, the more we will have it this day and every day. Amen. As we respond to God's word today, we do so in song. I invite those of you who are able to stand as we sing on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist cry, which can be found on the insert with your bulletin this morning. Please be seated. Come to our time of prayer. Uh, we pray this Sunday of peace for peace around the world, especially in Korea, in Jerusalem, in the Congo, in conflict zones all around the world. We pray for those in New Mexico healing from a school shooting earlier this week. We pray for those in California that have lost all to wildfires this holiday season. We pray also for the ongoing and upcoming holiday events in our community, for the Salvation Army bell ringing, for the Santa Paws fundraiser, for dinner season with love, Vespers, Madrigals, and Edinburgh Christmas Cantata that will take place later today as well. For these things, we go to God in prayer. Are there other needs and concerns we would lift up or joys and blessings we would share at this time?
seeing and hearing. Uh, Becky. Absolutely, and it really is easy. The time really does go fast. Um, two hours to ring bells either at Walmart or Kroger. Uh, Shauna, uh, who is our financial secretary, also the secretary at First United Methodist Church, has the master sign-up sheet. And if between the top hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Friday or Saturday don't work for you and you have another time you'd like to, call and speak to uh, Pastor Bob Cook or uh, Pastor Bill Kearns at Davis Memorial. I'd be glad to find another time that might work better for you to do that. Um, yes, and this weekend uh, raised a little over $2,000 total on Friday and yesterday, um, which combines to over $4,000 total, staying 85% of which stays here local. So we thank God for the generosity of our community as well as the people who uh, braved the cold yesterday and on Friday. Seeing and hearing no others, let us carry all of these things as well as what remains on our hearts and minds as we turn to God in prayer. As heralds of God's good tidings, let us lift up our voices with strength this day, praying to the one who comforts, restores, and heals. Let us pray for all leaders and people of the world. You have created one human family to live in righteousness and peace. Give us wisdom to order our common life according to your loving purposes, that your glory may be revealed and all people shall see it together. Let us pray for your church. You have given us the gift of the Messiah so that your church may be steadfast and true. Give us strength to follow your son until all have come to repentance and are reconciled by his love. Let us pray for those who are sick, those who suffer need, those who are exiled or in danger. You have made us for a holy purpose, to comfort and care for each other. Give us compassion to love our neighbor and patience to care for those in need. Let us pray for your creation. Your faithfulness springs up from the ground and your goodness looks down from the sky. Rid us of the laziness and greed that diminish life as you teach us to care for your creation together. Let us remember those who have died. Ever-living God, one day in your presence is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. Make us one with the saints who have found their eternal home in you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear us further, praying now together as we say, Our Father, standing for our sending hymn number 137 he came down thank you <laughs>
threats, the day of the Lord is coming. Therefore, go and live in peace, for God's salvation is near. May faithfulness spring up from the ground, righteousness look down from heaven as you walk in the way of peace. And may the blessing of God, eternal majesty, living word, and holy comforter be with you now and always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen.